I highly recommend getting a pair of microphones. Recording a stereo makes a huge difference when recording multiple people instruments at once. That's an interesting uh, statement. I guess it depends on what you're doing. If you're doing a choir, I would definitely recommend recording stereo. Um, piano, I would probably also in drums. I would also recommend recording stereo. Not everything is good in stereo. I think, especially if the microphones are close together, you can have an issue called phasing. So, if you're recording, let's say, acoustic guitar in stereo, where the instrument isn't actually so big, you're likely to have a lot more phasing issues. And phasing is hard to describe, uh, but it's basically if something's out of phase, um, it's just like a wonky sound. And sometimes you could fix it by reversing the polar pa- um, the polar pattern. Sorry, the um, by reversing the phase of one of the microphones and then they'll start to sound in phase. That's something people check with drums, especially when they're mixing. But if you're, uh, so yeah, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing stereo recordings for everything. If you're doing a choir, you probably will want to do that. So there's some, there's some miking techniques that you could do to avoid phasing issues, which are a real problem. As I said, um, XY, which is basically a 90 degree angle, of both microphones pointing in an, like this, you know, so if you have two pencil microphones, they'll look like that. That that kind of avoids the uh, phasing. And if you have a space pair, as long as they're far enough apart, there shouldn't be any phasing. If they're close together and they're kind of like that, then you might start to have some phasing issues. Uh, so just be careful if you're recording in stereo. What do you mean by recording in stereo? Uh, you could record uh, a stereo track, you know, just as you could record a mono track, right? Like one vocal, you could record a stereo track. So any DAW will give you the option to, you know, you choose your input. It says input, let's say one, two, three, four, and then you'll have input one and two or input three and four. So therefore, you know, you can treat a piano recording with two microphones, for example, as one track inside the DAW. And it will be, you can also record it like piano L, piano R, you know, piano left and right, but you could also record it as one stereo channel, uh, which makes processing a little bit simpler uh, every, there's workarounds for everything to change everything later, but but that's about it. What's up, Uncle Sroll? Do you have recommendations for inexpensive ways to soundproof? Uh, that's a very good question. I know they sell soundproofing equipment on the internet, and you could check out some of those options. I don't know how good they are. Like I had a professional build my studio. Uh, oh, shout out to Omar Carney. Uh, I'll put a link to him in the in the comments here if you guys want. And, um, but, but yeah, using just whatever you have around the house that will dampen and deaden the sound is, is the way to do it. You know, whether it's carpets, whether it's your, like a spare mattress, your sofa, anything that will deaden the, deaden the room is definitely the way to do it. Um, I guess at least in terms of treatment, soundproof, soundproofing, as I said earlier, is hard to actually make something seriously soundproof. Like you won't hear someone in the next room, that's very difficult to do in a home studio environment. And that's kind of just something that usually in the home studio you deal with. Like occasionally there's going to be noise. Home studios aren't perfect, but like the overhead in a big studio is is ginormous. So everything has its <laughs> everything has its uh, pluses and minuses, but usually you can make home studios work even with a little bit of extraneous noise. Most people don't notice these things in the recordings anyways, or if anything, they give them character and vibe. Nothing should be too sterile recording. The sterile recording has been done, right? They did that in the 70s and the 80s. We don't need any more sterile recordings. It's good to have a little bit of vibe. For example, you know, Steely Dan's been done already. Not that Steely Dan's sterile, but like we don't we don't need that perfect sound anymore. You know, we have, you know, look at look what's winning the Grammys. You know, we got you know we got Lizzo, we got we got Billie Eilish. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, make, make, make just as long as it has vibe and soul, that's a good thing. Jonathan asked how to play bass like a fat mofo. Um, just like feel the groove. That's my bass is all about the groove. And that's kind of how I play bass. I'm not a very technical bass player. I'm all about groove. I try to lock in. That's the number one thing. Noah says recording with two mics at once will stimulate Simulate your brain hears audio from two ears, and then when you're listening to audio later, you can distinguish audio coming from different directions in the recording. Yeah, that's true. If you record just using one mic, it will squash all sound into the middle. Right, so, you know, used to be, we used to listen to everything in mono, right? The the main Beatles mixes were in mono, like when they were releasing the records until, I think, up until Abbey Road were all in mono, right? So 
We used to hear everything as mono, and it's a much flatter sound. It's much less three-dimensional, obviously. Uh, And stereo recordings sound great, and that's why we're still using it. And uh, stereo is is awesome. You can still have a a stereo mix, even if stuff isn't recorded in stereo. It's important to point out, you know, you can record, let's say, one electric guitar and pan it on the left, another electric guitar pan it on the right, and you have a stereo image. It doesn't necessarily need to be recorded in stereo, Right, same thing with acoustic guitars. I don't usually rec- record acoustic guitars in stereo anymore. Usually, just mono. And if I want to get a stereo effect, I'll play the part twice, and I'll just pan one on the left and one on the right, and then you have a stereo image without recording it like that. So just because you don't record something in stereo doesn't mean it can't be stereo. You can also record one acoustic guitar and one vocal and pan them slightly apart, and you'll have a stereo image. Or if you use a reverb that's a stereo reverb, that will also give a stereo element. So that's not something. I wouldn't worry about if you're a beginner, you know, don't worry about the recording of stereo as much as later on. Any other questions? I've been at this for 47 minutes. I will not go past an hour, but I will go an hour if people ask me questions. So I see Yoni and Yoed just joined. If you guys want to chime in, if you have any questions. L'chaim. We should all stay safe wherever we are. Stay indoors. Listen to the rules it's not just about your life it's about other people's lives everyone's lives are at stake so got to stay healthy got to stay safe any other microphone questions anything i should talk about i think i've kind of beat the uh the microphone thing to death so i will stop talking about microphones and let's uh i guess maybe you know, let's talk about what you would do with a recording when you're done with your home recording. So let's say you recorded, let's say, acoustic guitar, a piano, and a vocal. How do you make that sound as good as possible? So most DAWs will have EQs and compressors and reverbs and stuff like that. And, you know, I usually tend to use an EQ first to fix any, you know, spectral problems I hear. There's too much boominess there's not enough brightness or there's too much harshness and I'll kind of use a um I'll use an EQ to kind of fix that first and then I'll usually compress something to make it sound a little bit more forward and then uh depends on what it needs uh so usually reverb compression what do you use stereo reverb compression when should you use stereo reverb and compression okay yeah the other, the other option is to send out, this is my big ask, I guess, is if you need mixing, I'm happy to do remote mixing from my studio here, uh, and I can help make your the, the tracks that you have no choice but to record at home sound a little bit better. Um, no pressure, but that's just my, my little ask. Um, when should you use stereo reverb and compression? Uh, you should... Depends on what you're going for, but stereo reverb... I almost always use stereo reverbs because they just give more ambience because stereo gives that 3D vibe. So if I'm sending something to a reverb that's stereo, it'll usually be come alive a bit more, but you could use mono reverbs. And something that's interesting that you could do is, let's say you have a guitar on the left, you could send it to a reverb on the right, and that could also give like an interesting stereo image. So there's a lot of tricks and sticks you can do um, playing with stereo imaging. Uh, compression. Compression... Okay, so compression is like the most difficult thing to explain to a noob. EQ is easy. You you lift a band, you hear more mid-range, you hear less mid-range, whatever. Compression is difficult to hear and to understand, and it's just about, it's basically you have a threshold, and when the audio signal hits the threshold, it compresses it by whatever the ratio that you set it to. So if it would go up 4 dBs above the threshold, but it's set at a ratio of 2 to 1, it'll only go 2 dBs above the threshold. So you're dynamically limiting, you're limiting the dynamics of the track. Um, so I use compression for two different things. I use compression to level the dynamic range. For, so I would call that functional compression. So if I hear that, let's say the acoustic guitar, sometimes it's poking out and sometimes it's poking back, or, like, or a lot with a bass, let's say. Bass sometimes is too forward, sometimes it's too, pres- it's too far back in the mix. So usually I'll just pop a compressor on it so it sounds pretty even throughout. And then I don't have to automate it make it go louder and softer throughout the song, it kind of will give it a good, you know, functional level of consistency. And the other thing people use for compression is it gives it a sound, right? It gives it a vibe, a tone. Um, For example, 
you know, exit music for a film by Radiohead when the drums come in. That's like a perfect example of an overcompressed drum set. Um, there and there's tons of examples. You know, Tomorrow Never Knows by the Beatles would be a great example of like overcompressed drums and compression has a sound and it and it adds an element because you're squashing the transients. The, the the transients are like the spikes that you see, you know, in the DAW after you've recorded, let's say, like a, a snare drum. Okay, let's see. You guys see that right there? That's what the waveform looks like in the DAW. So the very peak, where is my finger? The very peak is called the transient. Okay, so when the transient hits the threshold, it will compress it by whatever ratio you set. And um, man, how did I get off on this? But basically, so so functional compression is if you need to just level it out. And and in terms of like vibe compression, it's like getting it to sound a certain way. And when you squash that transient, it gives it a sound. And it's hard to explain other than to just try it out for yourself and listen, but it's often very helpful. And um, yeah, so I'll compress sometimes for both. So let's say for like a lead vocal, I'll usually, I'll usually do compression to make it sit consistently in the mix and also use the compressor to kind of give it an edge or a sheen or a squashiness or whatever. There's like a lot of things you would use it for. I think uh, that's that's why that's that about it. That about answers it. So yeah, in terms of mixing, you can you can try doing it yourself. Try using presets and mess with it. If you're stuck, you can ask me a question or you could send it out and I could try to help you make it sound better. Um, but I'll just repeat this again. Starts with the source. The source is the most important thing and getting your vocals warmed up, getting your guitar in tune in. Um, making your room sound as dead as possible will take a lot of the issues out of the equation. And uh, once the source is good and you're not recording it too hot so you have room so that, you know, it doesn't distort on the way in, uh, usually you can make something work. And and don't, don't, don't sweat the small details. Don't try, try to get too pristine. Try to get a vibe, especially if you're recording from home. That's, what you, that's your advantage. Your advantage is vibe, not sterile recording. Sterile recording has its advantages, but when you're at home, use your advantages. You know what I mean? It's like it's like anything. It's like in sports. You know, if somebody's really good at getting rebounds in basketball, then that's their special thing that they're going to use in a game of basketball, right? I haven't watched sports in like two decades, but but you know, using your using your you know whatever makes you special will help get, you know, don't try to compare yourself to other people. Be your own you. And if you use what makes you special to the best possible, you know, that's how you're going to get things that sound amazing. And so use the creative space of the home studio to get vibey, interesting, unique recordings. And uh, forget about the noise and just go for it and get your feet wet and get your hands dirty and just dig into it. And then, and uh, I guess the other thing I could talk about is getting inspired. And that's difficult. We're living through difficult and and uh, interesting times. So you kind of have to maybe meditate, take deep breaths, journal, write things out, whatever you can do to kind of deep breaths, a good cup of coffee on a mere peset or something if you have one. That's the kind of, you know, just get get yourself in a zone that you feel like you can create and then em- fully embrace the vibe of where you're at. Yeah, no, no, that's a good point. It's important to mention the big part of compression is turning the game back up so you can hear the parts that were originally lower while leaving the transients loud. I don't know if I would say leaving the transients loud, but yeah, when you compress something and you squash it, you're able to bring everything up. So what happens when you compress is you're, it's just much e- because the transients have been squashed, the peak of the of the waveform is lower and you could raise everything up more. So actually everything gets louder. And that's kind of, you know, people talk about how mas- the mastering, like the loudness war is what people do in mastering. People make things sound louder, and they're actually not making it sound any louder. They're just making it sound relatively louder because everything's more compressed, so everything is actually louder in relation. But when you compress a lot, there are artifacts, ambience in the room gets picked up. So let's say you record a guitar with a microphone in an untreated room. Maybe it sounds okay, but once you start mixing and compressing it, it starts to sound bad because now the ambience and the crappy sounds in the room are are accented, highlighted. And so that's an issue with compression that people don't talk about. Uh, for example, also when you compress a vocal, let's say the vocal sounds really good now, 
But based on the way 